Okay. Looks like we are. We are live. Officially well, live. Officially. I'm not so sure some days, but today I'm live. Officially, Hello, folks. officially Offici above ground. Yeah, I'm officially still above ground, so I guess I'm live. Hello, folks. Happy Tuesday. Welcome again. So it was nice to. Yep, you're good. Oh, yeah. Mars is telling me he can see us on his devices. God. We're trying yeah. this brand new software called StreamYard. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, you know, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. Mm -hmm. But we're very, very excited to be able to have guests back on because yes. for a good few months, we couldn't unfortunately connect using Facebook. But with StreamYard, we can. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. one of our esteemed clients. This is why we're wearing yellow yeah. because it's the uh, he's joining us from the Sunshine State. Do you okay. want to tell the folks who's joining us today? I will indeed. We are, I hope, live with David Pomeranz, who is in Clearwater, Florida. Hello, David. Are Hold you on. with us? Hello. There he Hi. is. Hello, I'm here. I wish I knew I could. I'd worn my yellow. I'm sorry. Oh, we'll we'll check on the wardrobe. We'll get a time. banana or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's lovely to have you. Finally, thank we've you. Thank you, Angie. Hello, Ruth. Good, uh, hello. good morning. Mm. So uh, I guess it falls to me to ask you to tell us all about yourself. Well, not so, all about. Not, not, not all. Oh, my goodness. Know, not the naughty stuff, you know, but the uh, the printable stuff. It's a family show after all. Well, so, so, yeah, I mean, basically, obviously, you're, you're a New Yorker originally. And yep. uh, now, yep. now a, a happy Floridian, Floridian in the Sunshine State. Mm. Um, how did you get started? Was it a formal music training at school or in Temple? Or how on earth did your whole musical journey begin? That's interesting. It's funny you should say Temple. Uh, before the Temple thing, I was five years old. This is true. I was five years old. My parents, my mother and my dad, would bring into the house every kind of music under the sun. Harry Belafonte and Judy Garland and Rachmaninoff and Elvis Presley and everything, <laughs> and, you know, Latin stuff. And uh, one of the things they brought in, um, and living in New York, I had a chance to see some Broadway shows later on, but I, I got the cast album of West Side Story, the original. And I sat on my den floor, five years old, listening to the score to West Side Story and I experienced uh, the closest thing to God that I'd ever been in touch with. And, and almost actually since, to be honest, it, it, it was such a deep experience for me. And it wasn't like, oh, I want to be a musician. It wasn't like that. It was like this experience, I want to live here. I, I want to drink this. I want to eat it. I want to live in it. I want to breathe it. And, uh, and I just naturally gravitated to doing everything with music. That's really literally how it started. And then just really quickly, the other thing you said about Temple, uh, maybe it was nine, nine or 10 years old, years old uh, my father and I would sing in the synagogue choir. And oh, wow. that was beautiful. That, and that was also a beautiful uh, musical experience because the Hebrew melodies were so incredibly gorgeous and, and uh, got me into, it scratched a different itch. And it, yeah. was, and it was lovely, just lovely. My West Side Story was the first movie I ever went to see. I think I was two years old or one or two or something. I'm not sure. And, yeah. and, and of course, went to see it and took me on her lap. Yeah. And uh, I fantasize about remembering it for the first time. But, of course, I don't. Probably I was, not, yeah. I was too young. But, yeah, what a story. And, and to think that, you know, they, they basically updated Romeo and Juliet. That's right. Well, yeah. that's, no, that, was, that was genius all around. Mm -hmm. Rainer Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, Arthur Lawrence. I mean, yeah. complete and utter genius. And but David Pomeranz and Kathy Lee Gifford. To oh, add to uh, yes. Later. Oh, yeah. But, but, the, but you know, the, the, that composition, that, that yeah. Bernstein thing and, and Sondheim, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And, and I still, that, that's still probably exactly. the, the, greatest, the yeah. greatest Broadway score, at least to me. What was the first uh, instrument you took up? First one was uh, piano. Uh, I learned some chords. You know, I shirked uh, the uh, the piano lessons because that was too tough. <laughs> I just I decided to go. You know, what? Show me a C chord. Gong, clink, and I learned to play songs, and I made up little songs playing these chords. Wow! So that's you know that's how I started that, and then um, and then I, I played drums. I got drum lessons. 
and then the guitar was the third one. Wow, very interesting. And when you say you made up songs, how old were you when you first started composing? I don't know, maybe, uh, I gosh, I don't know, 12? Really? Well, yeah, I mean, there weren't any good. You know, I, I, I wrote a song, uh, there was a kid in my school called Steven Strocker, and he was running for class president in sixth grade or something. And I wrote a song and I wrote a musical for him. It had like half a song in it. I didn't finish. <laughs> I'm still working on that. No, but it was called Steven. And then the song was Steve and Strocker. You're off your rocker. You'll never get into space. That's as far as I got. Oh, okay. Well, well, I don't know what it meant and I don't know what it means. We could we could give the rest to Wayne Brady and the improv crew and see what happens there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So how how did you progress from there to uh, one of Andrew's yeah. questions here yeah. is you know yeah. what how do you get from banging out songs at twelve to where you got with the you know the, when where you are now with the heights of like the Mucky Mucks the five star A list artists recording your songs? I mean, is it I mean, obviously it's a long journey and we only have about 30, 40 minutes, but what was the real first big break of, I can do this and this is gonna work? Wow. Hmm. Well, first- the, I mean, Did I you mean, get a publishing contract or did you- well, yeah, not, was, it, tin, was Tin Pan Alley still a thing? Pretty early, yeah. Well, it was a little ish. Uh, New York, uh, but it, well, it did exist. Um, I came up, actually I was uh, maybe 16 ish, something like that. And my dad worked in the garment business in New York, making schmatas, as they say, that's how they call it. You know? <laughs> you know, I'm in the schmata business. And you have to, your sound, your voice has to sound. Yeah. Like and, and, he, and he worked with a guy or knew a guy who was the father of Leslie Gore. Oh, yeah. really? Right? It's my party. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to. Leslie Gore. Yeah. And so, as would have it, the fathers got together. My son, and he, she, he went, my daughter, and, <laughs> and they put us together. And Leslie and her brother, Michael, who became a very a famous uh, screen uh, composer, uh, were my first managers. Oh. And uh, we made some demos and mm -hmm. wow. kind of went from there. It kind of went from there. And then it wasn't until I was around 18 that I started a shop for a record deal and got one when I was 19. Wow. So, yeah. so who was, what company was the record deal with? It was with Decca. Oh, really? Yeah. I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> and you might have something to do with them. Let's not even go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Beatles failed their, uh, their Decca audition, God Love Them, on New Year's Day, yeah. 1963, yeah. uh, all hung over. They, they had a, a Decca audition call at the London studios on January 1st at 9 a.m. Who does that for yeah. a pop group, yeah. a rock band? It's drove, um, not nice, is it? Joe from Liverpool the night before got lost in the fog, and uh, John Lennon put it, we just arrived in London in time to see the, the crazies diving into in, Trafalgar Square the, Fountain. Into the fountain. At midnight. Midnight. You know. So yeah. they slept in the freezing cold van and failed their audition the very next day. Yeah. But Decca, in their wisdom, you see, they signed David Pomeran, so they made up for it. There you go. They made yeah. up for it. Decca did say, well, these guitar groups are not going to go far. Yeah, they're on the and way these out. These guys, no, they'll never make it. Well, they were very classically oriented until, I mean, then the Who yeah. came later and, and Elton and all that stuff. About yeah. later, yeah. later. But they were classic, the classicals. I so now, when did, you first have, when did you first have one of your songs recorded by somebody famous? And who was it? Well, it was Lou, it was Lou Rawls. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I, it was uh, in '73 or something. Yeah, or and I hadn't, you know, and uh, I wrote a song called "Let It Be Now," and I got the vinyl. And yeah. I, I was living in L.A. In, in Malibu up there in the in the hills, and I and I raced up to my house, and I, it was this big, beautiful record. And I said to my wife, then I said, "Listen to this," and it was "Let It Be Now," and it was Lou, and he had that sonorous, beautiful Lou Rawls voice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm and I'm just in heaven and, and and he sings the song proper and then and then at the at the middle he goes and he goes let it be now and he gets to the point and he goes my darling let it be now 
<laughs> you know I love you so. And he goes on with this. And I'm going, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. This isn't happening. <laughs> is, no. it too late to, is it too late to stop the presses? You know, the great Lou Rawls and always great. But that was, that was a shock. It was probably his producer's fault because producers always you know, sort of take yeah. over. I, I co-wrote a song once upon a time called Cigarette in the Rain with my then partner, Barry Coffing. And um, we got it picked up by the amazing Randy Crawford of the Crusaders fame. And oh, I yeah. was flying to London to do something and the producer, Robin Miller, who's a brilliant producer, mm -hmm. uh, invited me into the studio. And um, I had written this about Julian Lennon losing his relationship with John over like that. Uh, like a cigarette in the rain, a single drop puts out the flame and the drop was the bullet. And oh. so it was a real heart wrenching ballad. And Robin Miller turned it into a cute little uh, sort of upbeat reggae tune. Yeah. <laughs> so producers will. But you know, yeah, Jesus said it, they know not what they do. What kind I, of I, I, and, and Randy, Randy was like, you know, he's the producer. I mean, I, you know, right. but I, yeah. But, but, so, the song, but the song is still there. I'm sure it communicates. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. sold a million and we cashed the check. So, you know, how bad can it be, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I think when I was researching you for us to have this chat today, Barry Manilow figured in one of your recordings. Yes. Oh. And, and a long uh, friendship. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell us about Barry Manilow and how you got together. Him. Well, I was uh, I was a recording artist for Arista, as was Barry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, well, every, I don't know if your listeners know Clive Davis. He's kind of famous, Clive Davis. Oh, yeah. And Clive, yeah. that was, we were we were amongst his first his first artists. It was myself, it was Barry, and it was Melissa Manchester. And, and, and Eric, Eric Carmen. And wow. we would all go to his, uh, to Clive's bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yeah. Uh, and he, it was, he was, he would hold court. I love Clive, by the way. I adore Clive Davis. Anyway, yeah. so he, but he would hold court and, and he would play the latest releases, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember him putting on Mandy oh. on, the, on the record player. And there were producers and A&R people from the record companies and such, and a few of his, his friend, friendly artists. And we would all weigh in as to, you know, was that a good record? Did you like that, you know? And uh, that's where I kind of got first familiar with Barry. And in, uh, gosh, when was it? 76 or so, I, I was asked to write a, a song for the Carpenters, which I got busy to do and wrote a song called Trying to Get the Feeling Again. Wow. And Trying to Get the Feeling, uh, so we gave it to the Carpenters. I never knew what happened to it. I never heard back. And next thing I knew, that my demo got to Barry through his friend, Bette Midler, who he had wow. been producing, you see. Wow. Wow. So, you know, gave it to the guys who gave it to blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so Barry recorded uh, that hit. That was my first big hit, trying to get the feeling again. Mm -hmm. And later on, just as a postscript, uh, and, and the Carpenters never released it until posthumously, yeah. they released Karen's tracks that had never been released, and that was on there. I think yeah. Karen has one of the most pure oh, female yeah. voices ever. I mean, probably my two of my favorite female art vocalists are Karen Carpenter and Anne Murray, just because they mm. don't mess with the note. They just sing it like the songwriter intended, right? Yeah. That's true. That's yeah. Right. They have a respect for it. That's very true. Yes. A lot of other singers, what I call, they worry it to death. Just <laughs> come with the song and don't. It's like a dog with a bone and a. <laughs> I mean, uh, acrobatics are something I could never do, and I have the greatest admiration for them. But it's like what Coco Chanel said. Um, you know, I, I think of some of these people who oversing the song. I wonder if that, first of all, getting paid by the note, because, you know. <laughs> Maybe. Right? Could and secondly, Coco Chanel said, Whatever you're dressed for, before you leave the house, remove one piece of jewelry and you're still overdressed. So, yeah. Like, yeah. One yeah. note too many. One note too many, exactly. Well, now, but you know, it's a very, I mean, you're, you're both in music, music and songwriting and such. You know that when you, um, when, it's, when it's right, it's right. And uh, hmm. an artist can make, do a rendition of something yeah. that can surprise you yes. in, a, in a good way. 
Yes. Oh, yes. Well, you know, in the English language, the word render means to tear apart. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so that's, that's, interesting. that's interesting. As in butter, as in butter in a... In a that's right. right. Tear apart. Exactly. Yeah, right. Now, listen, you've traveled all over the world. Tell us about some of your adventures in... You've oh, been to Moscow and... The Philippines, the Philippines a lot. What? Tell us all about yeah. that. How well, that I mean, I'm a I'm a touring musician. That's what I've done all my life, uh, yeah. and uh, the, it's taken me to interesting places. I've always been interesting in pro interested in projects, yeah, and um, with a purpose, like something more than well. Here's my new record. I just, so, um, gosh, I one I was really proud of. Um, there was a guy called Alexander Mar Malinin, mm -hmm. uh, Sasha Malinin, more popularly, and. He and I met in Los Angeles, and he was the lead singer for, for the first Russian band to play in the United States. Oh. Or rock band, anyway. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and we met him at a club I was playing in, and we, we, he was the lead singer for this band, and we, we being Peter Schles and myself, also a wonderful songwriter, uh, said, you, come here. And we got to know him, and uh, Peter and I wrote a song called Faraway Lands. Yes which was the purpose of which, and it was at Glasnost time, it was when Gorbachev was considering, this, yeah. the, the Soviet Union was wobbling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we figured that we would do a duet recording that would express uh, that, we're the, that we're the same. Yes. And the chorus of Faraway Lands is, Faraway Lands, Faraway Places, used to be oceans separating our shore, but touching the hands, and finding the faces, somehow there's just no far away anymore. Wow. And yeah. we recorded it in LA and in Moscow. Oh, I see. And I had quite an adventure. I, when we get it, yeah, we'll have a little wine. I'll tell you about it someday. But it, it, it was an amazing adventure recording in, in Russia. We got the beautiful record. It was released on a and and uh, and we traveled the world uh, promoting it. That was an extraordinary experience. Did you record at Melodia Studios? Yes. How yeah. do you know Melodia? Did you I, record there? I, I recorded there too. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wait a yeah. minute. I think you, I remember you telling me this when we first met. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Well, very, very bare bones, old school. Yeah. And they used to press it because it cost extra rubles to make the vinyl round. They used to put the grooves in round, but press them square. It was just cheaper to press them as a square. So when you opened an old Russian LP, it was square and you put it on the round record player, the grooves oh. were in a circle, but it was this square sharp edges with all the extra vinyl. And then somebody came up with being able to, um, with some kind of exacto knife, cut the circle out and do something else. They formed another whole industry with the vinyl making, I don't know, record middles for singles or something crazy. Well, we had, you know, we had a funny relationship with them. You know, either one of us would invent, would invent technology. Yeah that the other one would refuse to adapt. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not invented here. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and that's, yeah. that, that's yeah. one of them. I remember, uh, uh, gosh, well, this is, this is funny. You'll enjoy this. So we're in, we're in Melodia recording Sasha's uh, uh, a take of the song. And um, this was before, I don't know if it was before, but we weren't using pitch correction all that much, you know. Um, and, uh, but we wanted to punch in a couple of words. Yeah. They, oh. weren't, per they weren't perfect. Mm -hmm. And so we said to the engineer, okay, so here's what we're going to do. So punch in that, that line or half line and then punch right out again. And he stopped. He looked at us and he said, we do not record this way. <laughs> Real men do not record this way. Oh, real man. Oh, and what he was, you know, and it was, it was like, it was shocking and telling, but at the same time, I understood, you yeah. know, yeah. he said, this is, we record the, the, the performance. Yeah. You don't mess with it. It's dishonest. I mean, we went, got into all of that, you know, it's not honest to do that. You know? And he's, well, right, I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> no, I mean, if you come from, a country that for decades turned out the finest Olympic team, you don't get a second shot at the shot put or the long jump halfway through. He's like, oh, no, I didn't make the gold medal. Let me do that again. <laughs> well, you either win or you don't, right? That's <laughs> so, right. 
Wow. That's right. Tchaikovsky write, plays it and writes it and plays it, and that's it. That's yeah, it. done. Next. Movie. Yeah. yeah well, well and, and a lot of those old Melodia archives of the classical recordings, Shostakovich and Kachaturian and all of those things, they were recorded live with the symphony orchestra. Yeah. No breaks, no wee wee breaks, no water, no take. Mm. It's mm. unbelievable. Yeah. When you when you hear the, the perfection of that. But yes, and I know what you mean about the Russians are not invented here. You know, we, we went over there several times and I was trying to um, introduce them to this thing called the internet. And they're like, internet, yes, no, is, is capitalistic. We don't internet, not, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, they do now. <laughs> they, well, they sure do. Uh -huh. do. Uh, we don't go there. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> on the, on, on, continuing on the international journey, sure. what was your introduction to and tell folks in the U.S. who may not be aware how crazy it is for you in the Philippines. Oh, well, that, that was a that was a, a, a surprise and, and a blessing. And uh, I say, you know, that's a kind of a show busy thing to say, you know, it, is, it was a blessing. No, no, <laughs> it was a complete gift from yeah. the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> because honestly, my, my recordings, and I'd been making records all the time. I was on Atlantic and, uh, and, uh, and of course, the Arista album. And uh, somehow those recordings got played in the Philippines. And uh, in the 90s, or first in the 80s, pardon me, I got a phone call from a producer there who wanted to bring me and my band over and play, give us a lot of money and we play in this huge place. And, and I, thought it, I thought it was kidding. Some, what, why, what, who, where, who are you? <laughs> it was one of those moments. Yeah, sure. And uh, sure enough, it was for real, and we, we went over there, played this wonderful concert, and uh, and sure enough, it was screaming honestly, and and you'll appreciate this, you know, in, in the Beatles context. So basically, I'm I'm walking off the plane, and there are you know thousands of kids screaming, yeah, and, and photographers, and and I swear, I looked over my shoulder to see who was on the plane. Yeah. Uh, w what's happening here, right? Yeah. And then, and it kind of went from there. So the, the short story of it is this. So I, we played the show. We took a big full page ad in the Philippine Star and said, thank you all so very much. This was excellent, wonderful, and it was. And we left. And like the, uh, I guess the ugly American uh, that I was at the time uh, or whatever, I, I, uh, I, I kind of forgot about it, you know, went on with my really important career. And, you know, well, I'm going to, you know, it's America and it's the UK and it's, you know, bro, bro, bro. and it got to, and I realized, my goodness, these people were so gorgeous and so nice and so loving and, and they embraced me with open arms. And, and musical I, too, right? They're very musical. Oh, and musical, like crazy. They all yeah. sing and sing very well. It's extraordinary. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so I thought I'd blown it and that was it. All right. A life lesson learned. And 16 years later, wow. in 1997, I got another call from the Philippines. Good. And, it was a, and it was a similar call as I had gotten before. Come over. Your songs are huge. Blah, blah, blah. So we did. And my wife and I decided to uh, play a game. And the game was, why don't we just say yes to everything and see what happens? That's a good instead of, instead of, right. It's it's good policy, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, instead of kind of you know weigh everything, well, I don't know if it's good for my career. No, just say yes to everything. So uh, MCA Universal Records came up to us locally, as well as to some other record companies. Would you like to make an album for us? Yes. You need to use our musicians. Fine, and they were they're great musicians. So of course yeah. you have to record record it here. Okay. And uh, do you have any song, any new songs? Yes, I've got this thing called Born For You. I've been I'm thinking about recording it. So we made a kind of a greatest hits album. We recorded new, new versions of these things and added some new things I'd had in the library. And the record exploded. And uh, we, we, I don't know how many we sold. We went 10 times platinum was the biggest record, international pop record in the history of the country. And it was, it just honestly, uh, Two things. First of all, we like the same music and yeah. they, they connected with what I was doing. And the second thing is, is we just we just said, yes, we travel to all the provinces, every island. There are 7000 islands in the yes. Philippines. Yeah. 
and just and we went natural, natural, natural beauty beyond bounds, right? I mean, and natural beauty beyond bounds. Uh, actually, most Westerners don't know the beauty of that country. Yeah. They they need a little PR help. Well, let's keep it quiet. So I'll be just, I'll be just empty when we all maybe you can maybe you can get get them them as a client. The whole company. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's that's the long short or whatever you consider to be answer to your question. So yeah. it's been it's been a love affair for all these many years, and we go uh, as often as we can and play uh, coliseums, and it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Well, and also you know um, I I see on your whenever you post on your social medias, which we'll, we'll put up at the, the end of this broadcast, we'll put up a link to David's, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but they really hold you up. Whenever you post on Facebook, I see that the comments come flooding in. Yeah. And I know, I mean, you have a million uh, followers on your Facebook page, but a, a goodly percentage of those yeah. is our Filipino people. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, of course, they're on a 12 hour different time zone from you. But it's amazing. I, you know, I'll sometimes watch you post something at six or seven o'clock at night your time, and boy, six a.m. in the morning, they're on it. My David, Sir David, they call him. Uh -huh. Sir David, my idol. Crazy. It's so nice Great. to know that you have a family of people across the world. You can't go there right now this minute, but just the love they send is just incredible. It's incredible. It is incredible from a career standpoint, and it's doubly incredible because of who they are. They are actually, and they're actually. You know, they they walk the walk. They're very they're very religious generally. Yes. You know? and uh, and they they live their religion. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's crime. Yes, there's graft. Yeah. A lot of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, welcome to the third world. But they're creeping out of the third. They're coming out of the third world, and deservedly so. They have a lot yes. of a lot of new building going on. There are a lot of enterprise, and they're they're, they're making it. We were uh, a while ago, we were in a hotel in Hawaii on a, a stopover to Australia. And um, it, I guess it was Filipino run or owned or something. Mm -hmm. But every morning I would hear in the hallways, I would hear this beautiful singing. And I went out to investigate and the lovely ladies, the housekeepers who were, you know, keeping the place humming, basically, um, they would sing as they made the beds and, and cleaned the bathrooms and whatever. And I said to them, gosh, you know, what, where does this come from? And they said, oh, it's just a Filipino tradition. We sing while we work. It makes the time pass quicker. And they was, I mean, tuneful to, a, I'm like, good grief. Somebody needs to do like the Hilton Hotel Hawaii choir of all of these Filipino boys and girls. They're just so incredibly musical. And I mean, look, if it, if it wasn't for Arnel Pineda, whom Jonathan Kane from Journey uh, and Neil Sean from Journey discovered doing That's Journey true. Steve Perry covers. Yeah, they Journey might not be touring again these days because they they yeah. just this incredible Filipino kid yeah. who's just got pipes for days. Yes, yeah, right. Isn't That's it funny? Right. I mean, yeah. do, do you think? I mean, maybe do they grow up in in church choirs or is it is it just a family? Yeah. I've I've never been there. I'm dying to go. Yeah. Um, do they stay at home? Do they? How does that when you go to a Filipino home? Yes, they are. It is a it's a karaoke festival. <laughs> and you can be sure that every home you've had a nice dinner, and you will retire to the living room, and they pull out the machine and the really? microphone with too much reverb. Of course, of course. And, <laughs> and you know they'll, they'll go fly me to the moon, woo, 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 and I'm going <laughs> reverb down. Yeah. Little. How funny. But they they uh, they covet the uh, it's it's part of their life and they are resilient as you know yeah wounds earthquakes yes. uh, uh, corrupt politicians and worse yeah and they uh, they have their music and their art I and uh, they're extraordinary I'm actually doing a project I can't quite say all about it right now but it's a, it's a uh, it's a, a musical on that subject oh that very you'll hear about it soon. Well, we haven't really touched on, well, before we get off the Philippines, sure. um, they have the 100 days of Christmas, don't they? That's right. They start celebrating Christmas. Uh -huh, they do. The Burr months. Burr, B -E -R, September, October. Burr, yeah, November. Right, yeah. December. Yeah. Surprise. And it keeps going. January, Burr, February. It just keeps going. <laughs> Uh, if they had their way, it would be all year round. Funny. That must have come as a surprise to you the first time you go there in September and it's, the Christmas trees are out. 
Sure. But I think, I mean, I think all of us probably if we had our way. I mean, if I may speak to from most of you, I guess certainly for me, uh, Christmas would be a lot longer than a season. You know, the beautiful, the lights and the, and the yep. spirit and, the, you know, so they yeah. play it out, you know, they live it. I didn't know about it until I saw an old Anthony Bourdain Philippines episode. And he said, you may think we shot this at Christmas, but it's the 25th of September and I'm sitting in a, in a food court in a shopping mall eating noodle soup and then playing Christmas carols. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew? Mm. But what, yeah. a, what a lovely, Great. charming way for a society mm. to just celebrate being happy for, you know, a third of the year <laughs> instead of the yeah, other way around, right? Let's yeah. get on it. Tell you yeah. what I want, <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to know more about Please. your relationship with musical theater. Oh, oh, Broadway, Broadway world yeah. and your, your Broadway. Broadway shows. And I know you can't talk about the current project, but. Well, the, but it, it goes back to what we first talked about. Yeah. Listening to that thing when I was a kid, yes. listening to those beautiful, beautifully written works of art that never die. And no, exactly. die because they're as, they're as valid and um, formidable in its area as is any Rembrandt or Van Gogh or anything yes. for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, if allowed to, by the way, you know, they're, they're kind of, they have to also, people have to be educated like they are in art school. Yeah. Yes, I've tried. They have concourse with Rembrandt, you know, where would you see one? Not on the internet generally, <laughs> you know, so you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to bring them back or remind people. Yes. And, um, uh, there are, so I, I feel the same way about well-written theater music, American and English theater music, the, the ones that are really know what they're doing. So uh, yeah, so I got into it and, and I got into it. We had a musical on, uh, I, I participated in, I didn't have all the songs in. It's called Time, it was in, in London. Yes. Back then, you know, you know Dave Clark, of course. Yeah, oh, and, of course. and our old friend and client, but he did. He's a good guy. We anyway, but he he produced this, this uh, show called Time, and a couple of my songs were in there. And then it kind of went we went from there, and uh, wrote one about Charlie Chaplin, and I wrote one of oh, yes, I wrote a tale of two cities, and uh, and we <laughs> did them all in the and we did them all in the UK, and we fell in love with England. We yeah. my wife and I, my wife Kelly and I, lived in England for quite some time. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, we lived in London. And yeah. in high, high gig. and uh, but it was a, uh, it is. I, if someone were to ask me where would you like to live, if it not second to New York would be would be in London. Yes, it's great. for sure, for yeah. sure. It's uh, great. Um, and then there's the uh, Kathy Lee Gifford partner, musical partnership, right? Well, well, yeah. Kathy recorded one of my songs called "Born for You," which yeah. I had written with David Zippel, yeah. and. Uh, she titled her album Born For You. Oh, and before that, she sang one of my songs called In Our Hands, which I wrote with David Shire. Do you know David Shire? Yes, yes. Yeah. David Shire. Um, and uh, so she sang that on the, she was hosting the Miss America pageant and she yeah. sang it on there. So we knew each other, blah, blah, blah. She recorded Born For You and yeah. became friends. Yeah. yeah. At dinner one day, she and I and Frank Gifford and others were sitting around talking about how much we love the theater, and she felt the same way. And uh, we got to work on on two two musicals at that time, and they one went off Broadway, and one went to Broadway. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just. I mean, it's got to be such a thrill. That, I mean, I know it's it's like a lifetime, decades worth of work to get to Broadway. It's like you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Practice. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what what is that feeling like when you you sit in the theater for the first night and the curtain goes up and there are your there's all your babies on stage? Well, it's 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 a bit indescribable. I had a feeling during rehearsal uh, when we opened this. It's called it was called Scandalous, and yes. it was, and, it, and it was nominated for a Tony for uh, for Car Carly Carmelo, who is the star, who is trans transcendent, just incredible. And um, Kathy Lee wrote the lyrics, and I wrote the music to half the score, and another man called David Friedman wrote the other half. And um, we uh, we got into rehearsals, but to answer your question, so there I was on the stage the first day we actually got into the theater and out of the rehearsal studio. And I stood on the stage of what was now called the uh, Neil Simon Theater, 
Yeah. And it was the Alvin Theater. And what had opened at the Alvin Theater? Porgy and Bess. Oh, oh wow. Thing. And I was standing on the lip of the stage by myself. There was, oh. a little, there was that little quintessential uh, bulb, the rehearsal bulb and the stand in the corner. It was just it was such, a, such a cliche. But I was, I was standing there and I looked down into the pit, the orchestra pit, and I knew that in 1935, George, either George Gershwin was conducting, I don't know that he was conducting, but he was sitting right there. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> with Ira next to him. Or maybe they or maybe they were pacing smoking cigars. I don't know what they were doing. Yeah, no. <laughs> but it was that but it was that was the moment for me where I went, here I am. Yeah, here you are, and here we are. And by the way, I just okay. wanted to mention how we met you, David, at the wedding of Peggy and Jimmy. Yes. Uh, right. That's right, our, our dear friends. That's right. Next to Ruth and Martin and I on the front row because you were about to perform. Yeah. And I, as a, a non-Jewish person, was honoured by Peggy to be asked to give my blessing. So I made it in all sort of Beatle terms. <laughs> yeah, it and, was great. And we, we just had a little time together. I know Peggy's watching us today and Jim. They're both watching us. Oh, this good. Time. Okay, yeah. Jim. So at least, yeah, at least we have two people watching us at least. Yeah, no, I was, oh, yeah, have I was just so thrilled that at, at 75, uh, a lay, a, such an accomplished lady, who had survived the Mumbai hotel attacks was finding love and getting married yes. for the first time in a wedding dress she bought 20 years before. Mm -hmm. she, you talk about make goals, right? Yes. And I, I thought that was overwhelming. And then I sit down and I look to my right. And I'm going, that's David Pomeranz. And I look back to Andrew and went, holy crap, that's David Pomeranz. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, there I was well, sitting next to you. And here we are. Nice. It's it's nice and, and a beautiful, a beautiful, uh, that party was gorgeous, and we lots, oh, lots of music. Lots of music was. Yeah, great. I still remember the food as well. It oh was yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that was the great one. That's pretty great. Yes, anyway, that's nice. lovely. Yes, yes. I'm. I'm. Go ahead. I, I, I don't know how much time we do or don't have? There's something I wanted to say. However, you if you have to run to your next adventure, that's fine. But it's Facebook. No, I'm enjoying this. People are still tuning in and yeah, yeah. loving you and saying, "Oh, David, David Barbara Hunterman says, wow, it so." Good to hear about David's songs, reminding me of those. He looks so young. You, that people want to know what you're taking. <laughs> Life, right? Life, yeah. Life, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I must be honest with you. I, I, um, I study Scientology. And, uh -huh. uh, and people ask me, why do you look so young? I swear. And I, you know, I have nothing to say, but I use Scientology cream. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. But there's something, there's something about it yes. that, uh, that keeps me very very uh, 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 kind of awake and vital. And uh, okay. I don't know how, whether it has to do with my looks or whatever it is, but uh, that's the truth. That's the answer. Um, I, I, and you spread a smile, right? Well, I'm a great believer <laughs> of laughter. I think laughter is definitely the best boot polish. Absolutely. Absolutely, isn't it? It's, 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 uh, it's, the, it's the, up, the upbeat side of life. That's it's, right, exactly. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, the delightful side. Because yeah. you just as easily go the other way. It's the glass be. half full. <laughs> I was the glass half empty. <laughs> well, well, that's right. yeah. We've got plenty of iced tea in this house, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so tell folks, um, I know that you're working on, because I'm privileged to be part of yours and Kelly's team, um, I know that you're working on some online concerts coming up and a chat show of your own. Yeah. Uh, in mm. technology and things like that and fabulous guests guests and gifts and prizes yes. um, tell folks where they can reach you your website and so on and so forth and then we'll uh, we'll hook people up and get them on the VIP list and let them know what's what's in 2021 for David Parents. Okay, very good first of all I want to acknowledge and thank uh, thank Ruth because Ruth uh, you heard what she just said right so she's that side of me that that kind of go come on come on Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so, my wife was that way too. She said, get out there, get out there, get out there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, you know, so and, uh, you know, I've never I've never been one to I feel like I, you know, I don't I don't want to be the guy in the in the carnival. I said, yeah, go to my website and who who and I, that right. Okay, well I'll tell them. But well you can tell them, but I would but not yet. Wait. <laughs> 
right. No, I would say, but I must say, no, so Ruth, Ruth, and before her, a man named Tony Melvin have put together a beautiful website for me. And, and on there is content and more to come. We have lots of bright ideas. And what I'd like to say, Ruth, you can say whatever you wish. What I'd like to say is what's exciting about working with Ruth and Angie is, and Martin, is that, uh, is that we, we all have a similar idea. We want to serve this thing about content. Yeah. Um, basically, all it is, is is ways to communicate and to, I don't know, either entertain or inspire or whatever. <laughs> Nothing highfalutin, but there is an urge to communicate. And, and a website and social media gives the way to do it. And, uh, and so I'm very grateful to be working with someone as, as, as talented and, and experienced as you are. Thank you. To to uh, you know help me communicate further to more people and and enjoy that that uh, experience. So well, I think it's about just being in service of being up, uplifting, right? Yes, I think that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And people, you know, have their good days and bad days, and in these crazy times of COVID, possibly more bad days than good days. And if if you can be there for them as an anchor, as a smile, as a thought, as somebody who cares. Sure. I think that's what we're all trying to do. And that's, you'll find some great stuff at uh, www.davidpomeranz.com. And on there, you can link out to uh, David's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and we'll be sharing this on his Facebook also. So I cannot thank you enough for carving out. I know how busy you are. Um, and I know all the things you're working on. So thank you so much for carving out time to have tea with us on T-Flix today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. And Angie, I want to say something to you as well, if I may. Uh, yeah. First of all, I tried your tea. Oh, and yes. It, and it's lovely. Good. And, and my wife, Kelly, adores it. And because she's a, she's like the real tr tea drinker in the family. And uh, she says it's yeah. perfect. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, and also, I'm excited mm -hmm. about your new book. We are hawking each other. But I really am excited because mm -hmm. I'm a Beatle geek. You know, I am a Beatle geek, and that maybe that's a whole other show. But um, you don't have any idea what kind of Beatle geek I am. I mean, I know that I know what strings were worn were were on what guitar in which song, oh, and gosh. I know all about it because because I'm deep in it, and and because of my musical interest in in Beatles. But uh, but your your book, yeah, is, is very very and it's a great idea. So yeah. I want to encourage everyone who's if you're watching this on my site. Uh, she's got this amazing book. Can you it just express a little bit what that's about? Yeah, it's called Here, There and Everywhere. And yeah. it's a guidebook to all the Beatles spots in Liverpool, London, Hamburg, New York and Los Angeles. And on every single destination, there's a QR code which you can scan with your smartphone and it'll give you a link to map directions, more information, videos and so on. So it's kind of an interactive multimedia book. We should write one on you. There yeah. you go. Uh, well, uh, that day when you got nothing to do. <laughs> and here was the synagogue where he was singing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, you can find it, of course, if you're overseas on Amazon. But if you want a signed copy, you can go to Mrs. McCartney's Tees dot com. But um, yeah, they there you have it. it. Makes great stocking stuffers. But more importantly, if you go to David Pomeranz dot com. You can, there's exclusive song downloads there that are exclusive just to David's website, handwritten copies of his lyrics, uh, signed, handwritten and, and autographed. And Christmas is coming, folks. And I think every household needs to download the David Pomeranz Christmas album. So there you go. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's a good, that's a good album. I like that album. I hope everyone likes that. <laughs> All right. Well, segued into, I'm going to pretend I live in the Philippines, put the kettle on, have a cup of Mrs. McCartney's teas and listen to your Christmas album. Lovely. Lovely, Bye. lovely. Well, Bye -bye. thank you so much for your time. God bless. And Bye -bye. we'll see God you. bless both of you. Thank you for the for the chance to talk to you. Well, you love okay. to kill. Yeah. And Bonnie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.